Welcome to the National Press Club. We're going to go ahead and get our evening started, so please take your seats. My name is Angela Gryling Keen. I'm a reporter for Bloomberg News and this year's president of the National Press Club. It's my great pleasure to welcome each and every one of you here tonight for our Fourth Estate Awards Dinner honoring Andrea Mitchell. The National Press Club is the world's leading professional organization for journalists. Tonight is one of our greatest nights of the year as we recognize an outstanding journalist with our highest honor, the Fourth Estate Award. This year's recipient, Andrea Mitchell, is NBC News's chief foreign affairs correspondent, and she's one of the most respected and accomplished journalists of our time. For more than 45 years, she has reported on some of our most significant news events in our time, in our country, and around the world. These include the nuclear disaster at Three Mile Island, the conflict in Iraq, numerous presidential elections, action or inaction in Congress. She even went toe to toe with Fidel Castro. We are lucky to have Andrea with us here this evening and are thrilled to present her with this award. We're joined tonight at our head table, starting to my far left with Lori Russo, Managing Director of Stanton Communications and Co-Chair of the Fourth Estate Awards Committee. Our guest of honor, of course, Andrea Mitchell. To your left, Jody Schneider, Congress Team Leader at Bloomberg News and Co-Chair of the Committee that put together tonight's dinner. <laughs> Susan Page, Washington Bureau Chief at USA Today. <laughs> Barbara Cochran, President of the National Press Club Journalism Institute and She will want me to get in the rest of her title, the Curtis B. Hurley Chair of, in Public Affairs Journalism at the University of Missouri School of Journalism. <laughs> Double applause. <laughs> and Jim Lair, Executive Editor of PBS NewsHour and the 2011 Fourth Estate Award winner. I am pleased to welcome a few other important guests in our audience tonight. First, we're joined by several former presidents of the National Press Club and the Washington Press Club. Would you please stand for a moment and be recognized? We also have with us tonight some non-resident press club members who've traveled to Washington to be here for this occasion. Would you please stand? I would like to send special wishes to past press club president Don Larrabee, who could not be with us this evening. Forty years ago, he conceived of and brought us our very first Fourth Estate Award dinner. That night turned out to be the moment of the Nixon administration's Saturday Night Massacre. <laughs> Before the age of mobile email, of course, it took a while for reporters in the room to figure out exactly what was going on. but they did learn what was going on eventually, and they slowly trickled out that evening, even though Walter Cronkite was the guest of honor and didn't exactly know what was happening since he was up at the head table. <laughs> so, while I think I speak for everyone in Washington in saying that we hope the government shutdown is uh, swiftly ended, we hope that it actually doesn't happen right now during our dinner tonight. <laughs> Turning back to Mr. Larrabee, he has been instrumental in putting together countless of these Fourth Estate dinners since the first in 1973. My sincere thanks go out to him for giving the club its signature event. It's not the same without him here with us tonight in person. The club's current leadership is here tonight, and I would like to ask the members of our Board of Governors to please stand. And we are also joined by board members of the National Press Club Journalism Institute. Would you please stand?
Thank you all for everything you do for the club. Now I would like to invite Barbara Cochran, president of the National Press Club Journalism Institute, to tell you a little bit about the Institute. Barbara. Thank you, Angela, and good evening. Um, first, I want to say what a great personal pleasure it is to be here tonight to honor Andrea Mitchell. One of my first assignments in television news was to accompany Andrea on a White House trip to New Mexico. I had been a newspaper editor and was new to television, so the powers that be at NBC thought this would be a good way for me to learn the ropes. Well, after a day with Andrea, I was amazed uh, and exhausted. She was a whirlwind of activity, constantly looking for nuggets of information, passing them on to nightly news, and planning her pieces. I knew right away I was in the presence of a television news star, and as you know, how she was those years ago hasn't changed a bit. Some three decades later, I'm so thrilled to, be, to join in saluting Andrea tonight. In addition to honoring a great member of the Fourth Estate, tonight's dinner benefits the National Press Club Journalism Institute, the educational arm of the Press Club. At a time of great change for the profession, the Institute offers training programs designed to help journalists keep pace with that change. We honor great journalists through our annual awards program, we advocate for a free press, and we work to build a new generation of journalists through our scholarship program. So as you can see, the NPC Journalism Institute is a worthy cause, and by attending tonight's dinner, you are contributing to it. From all of us, thank you for your support. And now please welcome back Angela to tell you about another way in which you can help the Journalism Institute. Thanks. Thank you, Barbara. The Fourth Estate Dinner serves as the National Press Club Journalism Institute's premier fundraiser. And as I'm sure you noticed, we have a silent auction in the lobby. Some great items are up for bid there, including VIP behind the scenes tours and tickets for two to a taping of Meet the Press, thanks to NBC Universal. We also have two tickets to Hong Kong and a hotel stay on the famous Hong Kong Harbor. There is a very cool upholstered chair in newsprint fabric that I would totally bid on if I didn't have cats, uh, but I encourage those of you who don't to <laughs> bid that one up high. There's a lot of other interesting and original items. Please take a moment during dinner, feel free to walk out and take a look in the lobby to check your bids or to place bids if you haven't already. And bidding will close at 8.15, so you have another uh, 25 or so minutes to do that. We appreciate the support of all of our silent auction sponsors who are listed in your program. Tonight, we are also honored to acknowledge the contributions of a special group of sponsors. First, Toyota, one of our longtime and most loyal supporters. Toyota is a silver sponsor this year, and I'd like to give thanks to Ed Lewis, who is a member of the Journalism Institute's board and someone we count on in many, many ways to make the club the great place it is. Thank you, Ed. Also sponsoring tonight's dinner at the silver level is Stanton Communications. Stanton Communications designed tonight's program as a courtesy to the club, in addition to co-chairing the dinner committee, supporting through a sponsorship, and providing a LinkedIn training session for the silent auction. Thank you, Stanton, for everything tonight. <laughs> Brown Capital Management also joins us as a sponsor at the silver level. Brown Capital Management also sponsored this dinner for the past two years. Our deepest thanks go to Eddie C. Brown and his team. Eddie is the author of Beating the Odds, Eddie Brown's Investing and in Life Strategies. Thank you. The American Petroleum Institute also joins us as a sponsor at the silver level. It's the second year API has sponsored this event, and we are very grateful for their continued support. Thank you. And we welcome the National Cable Telecommunications Association as a first time sponsor at the silver level. Rob Stoddard, NCTA's Senior Vice President for Communications and Public Affairs, has recently joined the National Press Club Journalism Institute Board of Directors, and we thank him for both his support and his enthusiasm.
Also sponsoring tonight is the Kiplinger Foundation. Austin Kiplinger, who is unfortunately not with us tonight, is a former Fourth Estate Award winner. The Women's Media Center, Levine Sullivan, Koch and Schultz, and Theodora Corsell joins us at the bronze level as sponsors this year. And thanks to Rosie Huff from Charmer Sunbelt for providing us with our fine wines this evening, and the Distilled Spirits Council for their support of the receptions both before and after dinner. <laughs> In addition, Penguin Publishers deserves our thanks for the books in our gift bags tonight, and I'd like to thank CQ Roll Call for its help in promoting tonight's dinner. Finally, a big thanks to Whole Foods and its talented florist, Emily Harmon, for the beautiful flowers you have on your tables in front of you. <laughs> Katie Malloy, Whole Foods' public relations manager, is here with us tonight. Thank you also to Ridgewells for the festive tablecloths. Thank you to all of our sponsors who are helping us create a vibrant atmosphere for a free press while we continue to serve as a watchdog in a role that our founding fathers intended. And your reward for sitting through all of these thank yous to our sponsors to whom we are most grateful is a delicious dinner expertly prepared by the National Press Club's executive chef, Susan Delbert, and her talented staff. So please enjoy the dinner, and we'll be back with our program after the entree. I hope you've enjoyed the wonderful dinner. We're going to get on with our program. It's now time as you enjoy your desserts and coffee for the moment we've all been waiting for, our tribute to Andrea Mitchell. We have with us tonight, yes. <laughs> we have with us tonight some very distinguished guests who will tell us about their years of knowing and working with Andrea. But before we hear from each of them, we want to share with you a tribute that NBC gave to Mark Andrea's 35th anniversary with the network. On this date, 35 years ago, on July 31st, 1978, Time Magazine was reporting on the magical idea for Test Tube Baby. U.S. Olympic hero Bruce Jenner was enjoying his pre-Kardashian days, starring in this nationally broadcast Wheaties commercial. Baseball legend Pete Rose tied a National League record with his 44-game hit streak. And NBC News, the esteemed parent company of this network, did something that would forever change the course of television history. On July 31st, 1978, NBC News hired a local TV reporter out of Washington, D.C., and they stuck her right on the air a few weeks later as something that was then called a general correspondent. When the final roll was called, D.C. voting rights passed the Senate by 67 to 32, with just one vote more than the two-thirds needed. But it still must be approved by 38 state legislatures, and that fight could be very difficult. Andrea Mitchell, NBC News, the Capitol. The incomparable Andrea Mitchell, 35 years ago today, was hired by NBC News, and she has not taken a break since. If you are a regular viewer of this show, if you're a regular viewer of this network, you are no doubt familiar with Andrea's intrepid reporting from all corners of the globe. But that reporting got its start here, 35 years ago, when Andrea Mitchell became one of the very few women correspondents regularly covering Capitol Hill and the White House. A White House which was then occupied by Democratic President Jimmy Carter. The president is planning to fight hard for his energy program. Tomorrow, he'll ask a group of freshman congressmen for their help at a breakfast meeting. 
Andrea is now NBC News's chief foreign correspondent. But way back then, she reported mostly on energy issues for NBC News. And in 1979, the big energy story in the entire country was this one, the Three Mile Island disaster in Pennsylvania. Even though Andrea spent years reporting in nearby Philadelphia, even though she was on the energy beat for NBC News. When Three Mile Island happened, Andrea Mitchell was kept back in D.C. She wasn't allowed to cover it because she was a woman. Andrea sat down with Rachel recently to discuss that particular experience. During the first week of the emergency, the news bureau chief, the bureau chief in Washington, was sending all of the men to Three Mile Island, and the only two women in the bureau had not been sent. And so finally, we, Friday night came, and we marched into his office and said, why is it that we're the only two correspondents that have not been sent? And the bureau chief said, because you're women of childbearing age, and we don't know how bad the radiation is. And I said, has it occurred to you that men's balls are as vulnerable <laughs> as women's ovaries? <laughs> and this is back in the 70s when no one talked that way. So... And I the got response sent, was? I got sent the next day. <laughs> more vulnerable, Andrea, more. I mean, sure enough, there's Andrea Mitchell reporting on Three Mile Island for NBC News back in April 1979. Andrea's career has taken her across the globe, where she's interviewed world leaders like Fidel Castro, and where her dogged reporting from places like Sudan has gotten her into trouble with presidential strongmen who don't quite get the concept of a free press. One of our favorite Andrea Mitchell moments on this show is her fearless reporting from the floor of the 2008 Republican convention in the face of an unforeseen foe. I don't know if you can see me because I chose the worst place to be on this floor. I'm right in the middle of the balloon drop. I am somewhere, somewhere on the floor of this convention, surrounded by balloons and confetti, but it can't be stopped. Anybody who knows or watches Andrea Mitchell knows that she is the single hardest working woman in television. Her day often starts as it did yesterday, reporting live on the Today Show at the crack of dawn. By 1 p.m., she's doing her hour-long show, Andrea Mitchell Reports, right here on MSNBC. And then there she is a few hours later, reporting on NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. As a result of that sheer grit and skill and determination, Earlier this month, the National Press Club announced that they have selected Andrea to receive the highest honor that they give out, the Fourth Estate Award. And I think I speak for everyone in this industry when I say they could not have chosen a more deserving honoree. Andrea Mitchell, you are a legend. You are an inspiration, and you are a treasured colleague. Congratulations from all of us here on Rachel's show for a brilliant career. We are quite sure it has only just begun. Tonight is a longtime friend of Andrea's. Please help me welcome Susan Page of USA Today. Thank you. Good evening. Every town has its sacred places where voices are hushed and secrets are shared. For the Vatican, it's the Sistine Chapel. In Green Bay, Wisconsin, it's Lambeau Field. And in Washington, it's the green room, and it's thrown the makeup chair. Real Washingtonians would rather be waterboarded than break the omerta of the green room. But at the risk of excommunication, I'm here to tell you that the real character of Andrea Mitchell comes through most clearly there. Many times I've been sitting in the makeup room at the NBC Bureau on Nebraska Avenue and seen the human tornado that is Andrea Mitchell sweep in. <laughs> Minutes before Andrea Mitchell reports is about to go on the air. Picture this, a makeup artist is trying to, you know, apply some makeup, which can be difficult because Andrea is simultaneously conferring with producer Michelle Perry and watching the State Department briefing on a monitor and dictating changes in her script. She's usually ignoring the poor sound guy who's trying to attach a microphone, and the floor director who is begging with her, rising desperation in his voice, to just get on the set. 
I was in the makeup room in February 2009 when a rumor erupted on Twitter that Tom Daschle was withdrawing his nomination as Health and Human Services Secretary. I saw Andrea with, you know, maybe 60 seconds to airtime, pull out her cell phone, dial his number, get Daschle on the line, and confirm it. Do you remember that? Then she went on the air and announced another scoop. Just a word of advice. Do not get in Andrea's way when she's reporting. <laughs> she's tiny, but she's tough. I first met Andrea when she was covering the Reagan White House for NBC, and I had gone on the beat for Newsday. One day there was a stakeout at Walter Reed Medical Center. A big, burly, unfriendly audio tech had planted himself in the middle of the front row, which is where Andrea wanted to be. Other reporters were reluctant to confront him. She was not. She persuaded him to move aside. And by persuaded, I mean he ended up on his backside on the ground. <laughs> this is a true story. He was too intimidated to protest and moved away. At Barack Obama's first inauguration, Andrea was on a flatbed of a truck that was tracking the new president's limousine in the inaugural parade from the Capitol to the White House. She spotted the Obama's car stopping so they could get out and walk a bit. She saw the chance to shout a question at the new president. So, of course, she jumped off the flatbed while the truck was still moving. <laughs> Months in an attractive orthopedic boot followed <laughs> until her broken ankle had healed. This is not to mention the time in 2011 when Andrea was interviewing Donald Rumsfeld on her show about his memoir. She went after various dodges about the origins of the Iraq war with such persistence and such a command of the issues involved, I particularly remember an exchange on the definition of stovepiping that it made me feel a little sorry for Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> Do you know how hard it is to make someone feel sorry for Donald Rumsfeld? <laughs> she is, quite simply, the hardest working journalist in town. Washington could learn something from Andrea Mitchell. She does not have a shutdown setting. How many times have you seen her start the morning on the Today Show and still be doing spots 12 hours later for the nightly news? Or be on a trip with the Secretary of State to Bali or Khartoum or Baghdad only to pop up hosting her own show at midday, which of course is in the middle of the night wherever she is. How does she do it? Well, there is the green room theory of Andrea. That is, the theory that she sleeps in the green room. Alan Greenspan has another theory, and at some evening event when I was marveling at Andrea's ability just to stay awake after the day she had had, he told me his theory of the two Andreas. This is true. He postulated that there must be two Andreas, one spelling the other, sort of like the Patty Duke show. <laughs> this would explain why we can see her simultaneously on the nightly news and hardball why she's able to make opening day at Yankee Stadium and Nationals Park, how she can be reporting on developments in the Middle East and the latest about Chelsea Clinton's year of the baby, how she can be here tonight to receive this award and also at this very moment be on a plane to Brunei to cover John Kerry's trip. <laughs> okay, that last one isn't true, but it could be. <sighs> The fierceness that Andrea uses to pursue stories is the same quality she brings to help her friends. When a producer's father was diagnosed with kidney cancer, Andrea dropped what she was doing and began working the phones to make sure he was treated by the best doctor in Philadelphia. When an NBC crew member's insurance company balked at covering his glaucoma surgery, she quietly stepped in and paid for it herself. When Judy Woodruff and Al Hunt had a child in intensive care at Johns Hopkins, her first friends to show up at the hospital were Andrea and Alan. Andrea has mentored countless desk assistants, many of them young women. When their 18-month contracts are up, she often works her Rolodex to help them find another job. 
They call themselves graduates of the Andrea Mitchell Academy. They've gone on to become senior producers at the Today Show, the White House and State Department Beats, MSNBC, and the Nightly News. Because, really, how hard can it be to work for Brian Williams when you've been trained by Andrea Mitchell? <laughs> Andrea is a woman of great passions. She loves the Redskins and the Yankees, Oscar de la Renta and George Clooney, <laughs> peanut, peanut M&Ms and quad shot espressos. Yes, four shots. I think that explains a lot. <laughs> After 16 years together, Alan Greenspan. After 35 years together, NBC. Andrea Mitchell is a generous friend she is a champion and a model for women journalists. She is a worthy recipient of the Fourth Estate Award. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And now offering a different view of Andrea Mitchell after working with her for 15 years is Washington Bureau Chief for NBC News, Ken Strickland. Good evening, good evening. Um, it is my pleasure to be here. 10 years ago, almost to the day, it was 10 years ago in November, a Washington Bureau Chief stood here and honored another member of the NBC family. That was Tom Brokaw. And the person doing that was Tim Russert. On the train back from New York, I happened to try to figure it out how to make it work on my iPhone, and I tried to watch it. And Tim said something after showing a video where David Gregory was mocking Brokaw. He said something that I think applies to Andrea. He said, and I'll just put your name where Tom's was, Andrea Mitchell is the best. Everything that she does raises the caliber of everything we do in Washington. It raises the caliber of the desk assistants, of the correspondents, of the producers. She simply is the best. Now, there are a lot of obvious reasons that I'm sure when they decided who to give this award to that they could have, and we'll just run through some of those obvious ones. We talked about the 35 years at one television network. Who stays in one network for 35 years? <laughs> that means a couple of things. One, we really, really like you. <laughs> or you found a way to outlast, outsurvive news directors, executive producers, vice presidents of this, you simply are the best. Think about the extensive coverage of Washington that you've done. Another reason in and of itself to get this award. You've covered the White House, Congress, foreign relations, energy, political campaigns. The only thing I think that you didn't cover that I thought I would see you with that whole who's the daddy of the panda thing. <laughs> and I think that was because you were out of the country. That's the only reason. Um, you've been to some of the most exotic places on assignment. Think about it. North Korea, <laughs> Afghanistan, the Middle East, Kosovo, oh yes. Pakistan, Haiti. I mean, these are not small tasks. Breaking some of the biggest stories. Who told America who, Dan, who that, who, that Dan Quayle would be the vice president, right? Before, before George Bush could even tell anybody. And of course, General Petraeus' resignation, watching that happen from a news point of view, being in the newsroom, if you ever wanna have a moment in journalism, it's to see Andrea working it. Running around, getting people on the phone, it is really a sight to see. And when we knew that story was gonna happen, it was just such, it makes everybody feel the sense of pride. It's very contagious, it's very contagious. Um, so there are tons of reasons why. You've knocked down walls, you've broken ceilings, you've blazed trails, you've apparently busted somebody's balls. Um, um, so they said I had to have one dirty joke, so that's it, I'm done. Bob Woodward, it kind of inspired that. But, Allow me uh, a moment of personal privilege to talk about the things that probably aren't so obvious that I think um, that if the 
the qualifications for this award were actually written out, I think would apply. Yes, it has been said, you are the hardest working woman in this business. Now, people have talked about you working from today's show to nightly, but I want to give a clearer picture of what it really, really looks like. It doesn't start with today's show. It starts with Morning Joe, which comes on at 6. Okay? And then there's the Today Show hit at 7. And then Chuck may have you on at 9. There may be some live shots between 10 and your show at 1, so you may do a couple of live shots maybe at noon. And then you do your show at 1. And by no means think that Andrea phones it in. Andrea is knee deep in, her, in whatever she touches. She involves everybody, but most importantly, she involves herself in everything. So let me go back to the schedule. So she does her show at 1. She might do Chris Matthews at 5 when he was on at 5. And then she'll do nightly. And I'll go and I'll say, Andrea, are you going to go home? No, Rachel wants me to come on. This is an important story. I want to do Rachel at 9. Now, you would think the day is over. No, 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 no. <laughs> because Scott Foster calls from the Today Show and says, Andrea, could you do something? Of course I will. So she'll either do it from home or stay in the bureau and write some more. All of this on a bag of peanut M&Ms. <laughs> if you ever want to calm Andrea Mitchell down, anybody who's worked with Andrea says, keep the bag of M&Ms. I think what I'm going to do is spend a little money, put it in a glass, break in case of emergency. <laughs> Quick, get the bag of M&Ms. The other thing about Andrea, and Susan alluded to this, is that Andrea is a mentor to so many people. And that, long after all the stories are done, is the part of what you do that will last. That is the legacy of what you do. The people's lives you've touched, the influence you've had on everyone, but especially on women in an industry that clearly cannot be kind to women at some time. You have blazed a trail for them that will go on and on and on forever. That is why you are simply the best. But wait, there's more. There's more. The other thing that Andrea does that is really not really the correspondent thing to do is Andrea doesn't mind sharing credit for things. When I was a Senate producer and I was working on a story that had a lot of involvement with Andrea, I think it was the, um, the lead up to the war, the weapons of mass destruction. And this is my first time really working with Andrea. Working with Andrea is like you're a medium tennis player and you're playing with Serena Williams. If you want to stay in the game, you better bring it. And so I'm working with Andrea, and she's like, Ken, you gotta, can you, you got to talk to this senator, talk to that senator. And I thought I really, really had something. And I called her, and I think her show was about to go on the air. And I said, OK, I've done. That's it. And then I turned on TV, and she says, Ken Strickland reports. I said, what? Is she giving me credit, or did she think I just blew it, and she doesn't want to take the blame for it? <laughs> I would later realize that that's really your MO. You realize it takes a whole team to do what we do. You realize that. And you go out of your way, regardless whether it's a correspondent or a desk assistant or a producer, to make sure that the credit is shared. That's why you're simply the best. Another thing, you inspire this sense of excellence for everybody who works with you. Sometimes it's inspired. Sometimes it's required. Sometimes it's demanded. Still, it makes everyone rise to the occasion. You sometimes find yourselves in these situations where things happen that make excellence come out in people that they didn't know they had. I'm not going to get this story perfectly right, but I, it's still worth telling. There was a gentleman who was a, supposed, a, a college kid who was supposed to have an appointment to see Andrea. It was a busy day. Andrea had to go downtown and do an education event. The kid shows up in the lobby. Andrea is on her way out. Somehow or another, she has a few things going on. She may have forgotten the kid was supposed to be there. Somebody tells her, the kid's in the lobby. She's on her way to do Education Nation. She doesn't have the package she really needs. She sees the kid in the lobby. She's like, what's your name? He says, my name is John. She says, hop in the car. <laughs> We're going to Education Nation. On the way to Education Nation, she says, I'm supposed to interview some athlete. I don't know anything about him. She says, find my, this kid she doesn't even know. Find out something about this athlete. Okay. 
They get to the event. There is no printer. There is no documentation. Get me a printer. Get me a fax machine. The kid will one day be the president of a news division. Always be nice to the interns, because one day you will work for one. Andrea brings out the best in everyone. Again, this is simply why you are the best. The other thing about Andrea is that she is very, very passionate about journalism. Andrea believes in journalism the way nature intended it. Screaming at people, <laughs> making them ask the questions they don't want to answer. Does anybody remember in the past month when John Kerry was doing um, a news conference at the State Department? You know, he's pretty much done. He is almost out the door but he's not out the door, which means for Andrea, he's fair game. Mr. Secretary, who else would stop but someone for Andrea Mitchell? And he stood there, it must have been for two minutes, off mic, answering Andrea's questions about Rouhani. That's why you're simply the best. The thing that you do for our bureau is you raise the level of excellence at all levels of, the, of all departments in the building. Anyone who's working with you knows it's got to be good. It's got to be good. Her commitment to what she does, a couple of examples. Andrea, at times, can be demanding. And at times, she has been angry with me. She has been unhappy with me. She has been pissed at me. And it's always generally about one thing. I want to go cover this. Why aren't we covering that? And I would say, Andrea, you were in Geneva last weekend. <laughs> you were in Rome the weekend before that. You've been on 20 times, and you still want to go cover something? Yes. Why? Because you're the best. Everything you do, NBC News benefits from. This award couldn't be more deserving to you. And so on behalf of NBC, we congratulate you, we celebrate you, and we wait for another 35 years. Thank you, Ken, for those wonderful remarks. Finally, we welcome Jim Lair, our 2011 Fourth Estate Award winner, to tell us his thoughts about Andrea. And we would be glad to have Jim Lair here on any occasion, but we are especially glad that he could be here tonight because he was already committed to another event tonight, but he was so excited about honoring Andrea that he made time to be at two dinners in the same evening. Jim Lair. I think the most appropriate thing I could say would be just one word, amen. This were, if this were a, <coughs> excuse me, if this were anything remotely resembling anything religious and there had been whatever and whatever, whatever at the end of the benediction, that's what I was here, I would be here to say, I would say one word and then I would sit down, I would say amen and I would sit down because the best is the word, the two words that Ken used, and, and uh, what Susan said about, uh, about Andrea, there's very little I can add to that. Uh, in fact, what I, all I can do is enhance it around the edges, um, and most of what I have to say you've already heard and you already know if you know anything about Andrea Mitchell. I'm sure all of you are either old enough or well-read enough to know about George Orwell's 1984 novel. You remember that? And you remember the story about Big Brother? Big Brother was always there. Whether, wherever you were, there was Big Brother. And particularly when you were watching a television screen, it was Big Brother. Well, 
Things have changed in the fictional world of George Orwell. Orwell has now been created in the real world, only it's now Big Sister. <laughs> Andrea Mitchell. As everybody already has already gone through and chronicled this, and anybody like me who watches television and is in the world of television knows, if you watch the first thing of the Today Show and the second thing of the Today Show and the 15th thing of the Today Show, and then you have the Andrea, Andrea Mitchell report, and then you have the wah wah Matthew this, and you have this and this and whatever, and suddenly it's 11 o'clock at night and you realize You've seen Andrea Mitchell all day and all night. <laughs> but the difference between Andrea Mitchell, Andrea Mitchell and the big brothers and the big sisters of the fictional world, what you see when you see Andrea, you see quality journalism performed right before your very eyes in ways that you don't see anywhere else or you seldom see anywhere else. Um, the, uh, there's a, a quality to Andrea's reporting, to Andrea's interviewing, that uh, is not rare, but is seldom repeated. I guess that's the definition of rare, which is what she brings to everything that she does is a sense of, first of all, this is really important. And it's important to her. And I learned years ago, I used to be on television for God's sake, and I learned years ago that if you don't transmit to the audience that you think it's important, how in the hell is the audience going to feel about the story you're reporting? Andrea Mitchell has never said a word on television that I have ever witnessed that she didn't transmit the importance of that, those words, that, that story, and whatever, and it means everything. The other thing that, that Andrea always brings to everything, that, that is what we do in our line of work. Many of you are in that line of work at this very, in this very room know what I'm talking about. She really cares about getting it right. You know what that means? It seems so simple, but it's what it's all about. And you can also tell that, and you can just, you can feel it through the screen. Andrea Mitchell, this reporter has done every damn thing she can to tell you what she knows for a quote fact at that particular moment. Not what she thinks, not what she imagines, not what she speculates about, but what she knows or believes or somebody has told her and somebody she trusts. And some of those people are heads of state. Some of those people are kings and queens and secretaries of this and all that sort of stuff. Or they're their sources and they're very close to them. And Andrea is, is one of a kind and uh, in that she uh, uh, and all the things that everybody has said about her in terms of, of her schedule. Um, Judy Woodruff, uh, her very, very, very close friend and, and uh, I think Judy's also on television. You're still on television, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But anyhow, the two of them operate the same way, you know, and I don't think it has anything to do with their gender. I think it has everything to do with what, with what I call the caring about journalism. Journalism is a caring profession. I know it's a word that's seldom used in our line of work, but if you don't care about two things, you don't care about the people you report about, you don't care about what they're doing, and you don't care about the audience for whom you're doing it for, in other words, reporting to, you're in the long run, long run you're, first of all, you're not gonna have a very good, a good time doing journalism, you're not gonna be very good at it. And uh, that's the one thing that, that, that Andrea has and that she shares with, with, with Judy. I would, um, I would say that uh, all of those folks who watch Andrea all day and all night, um, they're getting the highest form of reporting and of journalism that those of us who do this kind of thing for a living can provide. And if you don't watch her, then you're missing that. Uh, that's my that's a consumer report for the evening for me. Um, I would say to you that also you know that 
that when you hear her report, as I said, you get the word, you get the facts straight, but you also get nuance and intelligence and perspective from where it came from. And I salute Ken and the others of NBC News who've had the good sense and judgment to keep Andrea, uh, not only keep Andrea, but to permit Andrea to do her thing, and because her thing matters. And uh, I, I, on behalf of all, of all of us who care deeply about this and who uh, and, and, and watch Andrea operate, we thank you in NBC News. I would also say that, you know, when Andrea does a story, her stories are usually about things. In fact, they're always about things that matter. She's always there when it matters. And when it matters is also, those three words also apply to her on a personal level. Her husband, the one, the only, what's his name sitting over here, <laughs> knows better than anybody that Andrea is, is one of these when it matters people. A friend with a problem, as has been said, becomes Andrea's problem. A young person seeking advice or counsel needs an ear, gets an ear from Andrea. Somebody with a happening, sad or happy, gets a gift or flowers or words of whatever, of comfort, of congratulations, of whatever, from Andrea. Her personal thoughtfulness has the same professional tenacity as her practice of journalism. To say that she deserves this Fourth Estate Award is like saying, the sky is blue, you get wet when it rains, and the United States of America deserves a government that works. <laughs> I, I am delighted to be part of this evening to honor one of our line of works very, very best, Andrea Mitchell. Thank you, Andrea. Congratulations. Thank you, Jim. Andrea Mitchell is well known to all of us as a veteran NBC correspondent. She has many distinctions, including being one of the first women to have covered five presidents and the US Congress. No small feat, particularly considering what's going on here right now in Washington. Andrea, you've seen a lot, but maybe now you've seen it all. She's also covered U.S. fiscal policy, foreign leaders, as you heard, and the energy crisis, as you saw. We just heard from those of who know her well. We heard from them that she's recognized not only for her journalistic skills, but her, for her fairness, her integrity, decency, and caring about those in our profession and those in it, in addition to just caring about getting the story. Forty years ago, when the National Press Club presented its first Fourth Estate Award, Andrea Mitchell was a reporter at Philadelphia's KYW Radio, covering local politics. <laughs> Philadelphia fans. <laughs> she soon joined NBC News and has spent the majority of her career there, starting as a general correspondent, as you saw in that uh, wonderful clip, based here in Washington. The positions she's held include NBC's energy correspondent, White House correspondent, chief congressional correspondent, and most recently in charge of covering foreign policy, intelligence, and national security issues. She discussed her groundbreaking career in her book, Talking Back to Presidents, Dictators, and Assorted Scoundrels, which you can all read as soon as you get home tonight, thanks to the generosity of her publisher. Talking back, she certainly has, yet she has also given us, through her interviews, her hard-nosed reporting, and her dedication to furthering the highest ideals of our profession, she's given us a body of work that has earned her our respect and this year's Fourth Estate Award. Please join me in welcoming tonight's honoree, Andrea Mitchell. Thank you.
Thank you all so much. I am I'm really overwhelmed and speechless, which is not my usual mode. Uh, Susan and Ken and Jim and to Angela and the board and all of you here. Um, this is meaningful to me for so many reasons. To be honored by my peers, to be honored in this place where, as we know, things have changed dramatically until 1971. We could not be here. You could not be the president. I would not be the honoree, and we would not all be enjoying this, this lovely dinner. So our country has changed, journalism has changed, and um, it has changed largely because of the people in this room and because of Jim Lair and Barbara Cochran and Susan Page and Angela and her generation and Ken Strickland and all of you and my colleagues here. So there are so many reasons um, why this is a bit overwhelming. I, I look at Judy and Al and Kate Lair and Robin Spruill, who's you know, been the bureau chief at ABC longer than anyone, and all of my friends from the gridiron who have so generously joined us tonight. Uh, I am incredibly touched and honored. I'm honored for so many reasons. Um, thinking back, and I don't know who that brunette with the bad clothes and the awful hair was, but oh my god. Um, First of all, this is so meaningful because of whom you have honored in the past, starting with Walter Cronkite. I mean, when you think about that, the, it is so meaningful because of Tom Brokaw and Jim Lair and Christiane Amanpour and Bob Woodward. It's humbling to think about the extraordinary range of the past honorees, their achievements, giants like Cronkite. Uh, Cronkite, whom I watched uh, along with Huntley and Brinkley, uh, as, as a child and as someone who loved news and devoured newspapers. and My sister and I used to fight over who would get after school to read the evening paper that was delivered to the house first in our hometown. And um, one of my first great experiences was being chosen by my elementary school to write the, the school column for the hometown paper now. It was then Macy Westchester Chain, then Gannett in New Rochelle, New York, but I, I was a columnist for the Standard Star. That was a very big deal and used to get driven. I was in sixth grade, so I was 12 years old, and my mother would drive me down to Main Street and marched into the newsroom, always late with my copy on a Friday. And the editor of School News was Miss Virginia Clare. Miss Virginia Clare, and right out of front page, a hat, a cigarette, and gloves. How she typed in gloves, I don't know, but this woman wore gloves, and she was very tough, and uh, I was, as I say, always late, because Susan is not inaccurate. She's a great reporter, and the scene getting to that set at 12.57 every day is really something. It's, I mean, it's not always my fault. It's, <laughs> it's partly that the President of the United States and various news briefings around town all happen between 12 and 1 or 1 and 1.30, so it's, it's breaking news. Um, but to think about the people who've been honored by this organization, Cronkite, as I say, who, I mean, think 50 years ago next month, Cronkite looking up at the clock, taking off his glasses, tearing up, and telling the nation that John F. Kennedy had died. Cronkite, creating the turning point, as LBJ said, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost America, from his reporting in Vietnam, realizing that the, uh, the afternoon follies in Saigon with the casualty counts of Viet Cong were completely cooked. So you think about the unique influence that that man had over my generation and others to come. Jim Lair. Jim Lair, who along with Robin McNeil, created the only hour-long, authentic broadcast of evening news to this day, the PBS NewsHour, now superbly anchored by Judy Woodruff and Gwen Ifill. But the legacy of Jim Lair 
And that's only his day job. That's not even the books. Another is coming out on Tuesday. That's not only the, the nonfiction books, but the fiction. And such a superb friend. Tom Brokaw, coining the phrase, the greatest generation, after covering the 50th anniversary of the Normandy invasion. I remember so well being there. Anchorman, author, mentor, friend, straight talker. Remember, on that night, on election night in 2000, when Tom instantly acknowledged to our viewers, as he put it, that not only did we have egg on our face, we had an entire omelet on our face after getting Florida wrong, and getting it wrong several times in one night. <laughs> Bob Woodward, following the money to the revelations that supported by a singularly courageous publisher and managing editor, helped bring an end to the criminal enterprise that was known as Watergate. Christian Amanpour, another honoree, fearless in war and peace, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable, peerless war correspondent, advocate for the disempowered around the world. So being singled out and honored by my peers by this organization is incredibly meaningful. It's all the more embarrassing because we all know that television news, perhaps more than any other form of journalism, is a team sport. Ken talked about me. I'm here because of all of my colleagues at these NBC tables. I'm here because of Ken. I'm here because of uh, Antoine, his predecessor, my bureau chief. I'm here because of um, Gordon Peterson, who saw something in me when Jim Snyder, the late great news director, brought me to Channel 9 from Philadelphia. And when Gordon Peterson and Maureen Bunyan mentored me, and all of the, the great anchors and reporters and editors at Channel 9 who worked for Jim Snyder, and so, you know, some of, I mean, just look at some of the reporters who came out of that, that wonderful newsroom on Brandywine. Uh, and then Sid Davis bringing me to NBC and giving me the chance. So it is a team effort. When I looked at my colleagues' coverage, at Kelly O'Donnell and Luke Russert and what they did last night covering that breaking story on Deadline, it was breathtaking. It was great storytelling. Tim would have been so proud of the whole bureau and the way it all pulled together, and the way it has been led by Antoine and, and now by Ken. And of course, we think of Tim so much tonight. My incredible colleagues at NBC News and MSNBC are really too numerous to name, but particularly Albert Ochin at Nightly News, and Oliver Cox, and Jen Suazo, and Sabrata Day, and Matt Pitzer, and my partner in crime, Michelle Perry, who gets me through it all every day. Um, the people who have permitted me the privilege of reporting for NBC, morning, news, noon and night, whatever, and for, to have a program as Chuck and I do, um, to have an hour on MSNBC um, to do politics and foreign policy and um, really cover the Hill and cover um, the State Department and to have that opportunity and to have our political director, Chuck, who is the best in the business and such a, a friend and pal um, and compatriot. I am really the luckiest woman in the world. Uh, and to be part of the Gridiron Club, I mean, that is a different experience completely. <laughs> that has taught me how to be humble, how to be humiliated, how to wear a bear suit how to wear, most recently, leather and chains and be a motorcycle chick, as improbable as that might seem. In the 45 years that I have been a journalist, 35 of them at NBC, the last 17 also at MSNBC, our profession has also found from very different ways to write this first draft of history. This is a transformational process, and we are all coping and learning and struggling with it, and sometimes winning and sometimes not. I mean, I go back 45 years. The old Ampex reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders that we carried on our shoulders for radio. The film that had to be processed, we called it putting it in the soup. 
and then strung up and then sliced together, spliced together. The Olivetti, do you remember the blue Olivetti typewriters? Al, Judy, I miss those typewriters. We carried them on the campaign trail. And we had walkie-talkies, yes we did. Covering the Reagan White House, we had walkie-talkies. And that's how we communicated on the road. There were no cell phones. And then we got cell phones. They were about as big as a shoebox. <laughs> then we got out on the road with, Ron, with uh, Bill Clinton on the bus tours. Uh, Richard Strauss is here. He remembers that very well. We did that, that first bus tour. We left Madison Square Garden. We had these cell phones. They didn't often work. We had very primitive Basie's computers. They didn't often work either. We had a Winnebago. So in the Winnebago was my producer, Carol Ann Mears, and the best tape editor, because we didn't feed things back and have them edited back. We edited in the field. So we had um, folding chairs. I guess um, workplace safety was not such a big issue. <laughs> we left Madison Square Garden and headed down the New Jersey Turnpike with the newly nominated Clinton-Gore team. And Carol Ann and I were on folding chairs with Wayne Dennis, screening tape from the campaign rally. And the folding chairs are going back and forth. It was our version of twerking, I think. <laughs> and uh, sometimes the phone would work, sometimes the computer would work, sometimes it didn't. And the only thing we didn't think about in our Winnebago following the bus, and I was on the bus, on the walkie-talkie with Carol Ann, and I would say, check out this time code and take a look at this picture, and she's starting to edit the piece. And the next rally was in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, at an RCA plant at 5.30. We go on the air at 6.30, and this was the first campaign stop with the new team. And the only thing that we didn't think about, going down the New Jersey Turnpike from Madison Square Garden was Gasoline. <laughs> we ran out of gas. We could not edit that spot. And we were in an RCA plant, of all things. And uh, we used to work for RCA. They used to own NBC. And we ended up having to use the piece that was put together by KYW Television, the local NBC station, the, my, the one I had graduated from. Uh, and we somehow got on the air. It was one of the, the worst crash landings we've ever had. So I've seen all this whole change of, uh, from film to tape to digital, and now, you know, the cell phones that are no longer shoe boxes, and now the magic of the internet, and uh, a news hole that is 140 characters. And the way we communicate our stories has changed dramatically, but the fundamentals are the same, and that's what I'm, um, really here to share with all of you who all agree with me. So this is preaching to the choir, but we are in the business of telling stories, finding facts, and when possible, conveying them through the eyes of a person who has actually lived through that experience. An eyewitness, a character who knows what they're talking about. Providing context, adding our own experiences, which, by the way, is why diversity is so critical to good storytelling, to good journalism. There are experiences that we have all shared, but there are also experiences that none of us can share, that we bring to, the, to it, because we now have a diverse workplace and a diverse newsroom, and women and men and people of color and people of different generations. I was um, nominated for an award for an interview with Nancy Brinker. It was controversial. That interview, if it was passionate and if it was unusual, was different because of my experiences as a woman and my experiences as a cancer patient. And that is something that I brought to that story that no man, frankly, would have shared. And men, similarly, have experiences that I cannot share, and that is why we are so much richer and so much better in what we do today than what we did when I first came to Washington in 1976. When done right, we are helping to inform, 
we are educating, sometimes investigating, only rarely in my particular line of work, advocating. Whether in long form or on Twitter, our voices should be clear, our facts accurate, our mission transparent. Only two short years ago, as I alluded to, I faced the biggest challenge of my life. With the love and support of my incredible husband, my doctors, and my NBC family, I got through it stronger than ever. But only because of a lot of you in this room was I able to do that. And only because of you at those tables there and here am I here tonight. Only because of Steve Kappas and Brian Williams and Phil Griffin and Mark Lukashevitz and Yvette Miley am I here because they had the faith that I could come back and cover the 2012 campaign, which was my passion. I would have been shattered had they told me I could not cover that campaign. And I don't think my recovery would have been as rapid or complete if I had not been able to do what I love most. Doing the work that I love has been the best medicine. And for that, I am eternally grateful to NBC, to this family of newsmen and women. I am so grateful to um, the team that helps me put this program on every day at one o'clock, the fact that we've been doing this for six years, the fact that Chuck has been doing this for five years is really remarkable, given that he has three or four more jobs than I have and does it all so brilliantly. For your faith, for continuing to have faith in me, and for the love and support that I have from Alan, I am truly the luckiest person in the world for sharing this incredible journey. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, Andrea, for those inspiring and touching remarks. It has truly been a pleasure hearing about your distinguished career and honoring you with this year's Fourth Estate Award. The highlights aren't over just yet. One of the perks of winning the Fourth Estate Award is that it grants you a lifetime membership in the National Press Club. So no, you couldn't have joined in 1971, but we are more than happy to have you belatedly now. So I would like to present you with your National Press Club membership card. Welcome. We hope to see you back here very soon, of course. And I'm sure you will all be happy to hear that the evening will end with cordials in the Holman Lounge right next door. But before that, just a couple of final words. First of all, if you were one of the bidders on the silent auction items, please check out by 10 p.m. to see if you won and, of course, to pay. There will be, we appreciate that, there will be staff members at the front desk near where you came in until 10 p.m. to help winners with their payments. Secondly, I want to take just a moment to offer some thanks to people with whom we would have not had this wonderful evening, starting with each of you who took the time to attend. Your support helps ensure that the National Press Club Journalism Institute, its scholarships, and its Eric Friedheim National Journalism Library remain vital in journalism in Washington and throughout the world. This evening's event would not have been possible without the hard work of some very special people. In particular, I would like to thank our National Press Club and National Press Club Journalism Institute staff. The club's executive director, Bill McCarran, who is here tonight, has always made this event a priority. And the Journalism Institute's executive director, Julie Hsu, and her staff, Laura Hoffman and Laura Coker, deserve our thanks for everything they did to help put together tonight's event.
I'd also like for a round of applause for our executive chef, our first female executive chef, Susan Delbert, who provided our meal tonight. I would also like to thank Jody Schneider, Lori Russo, and the rest of the Fourth Estate Dinner Committee for all the work planning the event, and the Fourth Estate Selection Committee for the hard work of selecting our winner, Andrea Mitchell. <laughs> Finally, a word of thanks to all of our National Press Club members who attended tonight's event. The members are what make the club what it is. You are what makes the place a special one, and I am very happy to see such wonderful attendance from our members tonight. It's been a fabulous evening, and I invite you to join us next door in the Holman Lounge for the nightcap. We ask that you leave the flower arrangements on the table, so they, they're beautiful, but I am happy to report that they are going to a wonderful place. They'll be donated to the Fisher House, which serves wounded veterans, and they'll bring some cheer there. Thank you and good night.